Chapter 17 America, a very special relationship. Road Secret Society grew steadily and became even more sophisticated in the first decade of the 20th century. Its aims of bringing the entire world under British influence remained paramount, and Milner's Roundtable Associates traveled the globe to spread the gospel of the empire. The great financiers and merchant bankers centered in the city, the financial and banking district of London, shared the vision of a single world power based in English ruling class values. In his confessions, in his confession of faith, Rhodes had written of bringing the whole uncivilized world under British rule and the recovery of the United States to make the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire by which he meant a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America, working in tandem like with like minds in England. Clearly, the United States could not be recovered by force of arms, so wealthy elites in America with a similar mindset would have to share in the control. Road scholarships favored American students, with 100 allocated there, two for each of the 50 states and territories, whereas a total of 60 were made available for the em entire British Empire. The best talents from the best families were to be nurtured at Oxford University and imbued with an appreciation of Englishness and the importance, and the importance of the retention of the unity of the empire. Rhodes recognized the opportunities on offer to those who possessed great wealth to control politics and governments, and his ambition was driven by an understanding that the markets could be used to achieve political ends. The world was entering an era of financial capitalism where wealthy international investment bankers, the money power, were able to dominate both business and government if they had the concerted will to do so. This new money power seeped into the British establishment and joined the aristocratic land-owning families who had ruled Britain for centuries. Together they formed the heart of the secret elite. From 1870 onwards, London was the center of Britain's greatest export, money. Vast quantities of savings and earnings were gathered and invested at considerable profit through the international merchant banks of Rothschild, Baron, Lazard and Morgan in the city. Their influence and investment crossed national boundaries and raised funds for governments and companies across the world, across the entire world. And across the entire world, the great investment houses made billions. Their political allies and agents grew wealthy and the nascent British middle class was desperate to buy into a share of their success. Edward VII, both as king and earlier as Prince of Wales, swapped friendship and honors for the generous patronage of the Rothschilds, Cassell, and other Jewish banking families like the Montag Montagus, Hearst, and the Sassons. Sassons. And in doing so, and in so doing, blew away much of the stigma of anti-Jewish bigotry inside British society. The Bank of England was completely in the hands of these powerful financiers, and the relationship went unchallenged. The secret elite appreciated America's vast potential and adjusted the concept of British race supremacy to Anglo-Saxon supremacy. Rhodes' dream had only to be slightly modified. The world was to be united through the English-speaking nations in a federal structure based around Britain. Like Rhodes, Alfred Milner believed that this goal should be pursued by a secret political and an economic elite influencing journalistic, educational, and propaganda agencies behind the scenes. The flow of money into the United States during the 19th century advanced industrial development to an immense benefit of the millionaires it created. Rockefeller, Carnegie, Morgan, Vanderbilt, and their associates. 
the Rothschilds represented British interests either directly through front companies or indirectly through agencies that they controlled. Railroads, steel, shipbuilding, construction, oil and finance blossom, blossomed in an often cutthroat environment, though that was more apparent than real. These small groups of massively rich individuals on both sides of the Atlantic knew one another well, and the secret elite in London initiated the very select and secretive dining club, the Pilgrims, that brought them together on a regular basis. On July 11, 1902, an inaugural meeting was held at the Carlton Hotel, attended by around 40 members of what became known as the London Chapter of the Pilgrim Society with a select membership limited by individual scrutiny to 500. Ostensibly, the Pilgrims was created to promote goodwill, good friendship, and everlasting peace between Britain and the United States, but its highly secretive and exclusive membership leaves little doubt as to its real purpose. This was the pool of wealth and talent that the secret elite drew together to promote its agenda in the years preceding the First World War. Behind an image of the Pilgrim Fathers, the persecuted pioneers of Christian values, this elite cabal advocated the idea that Englishmen and Americans would promote international friendship through their pilgrimages to and fro across the Atlantic. It presented itself as a spontaneous movement to promote democracy across the world, and most of the membership truly believed that. But the pilgrims included a select collective of the wealthiest figures in both Britain and the United States who were deeply involved with the secret elite. They shared Rhodes' dream and wanted to be party to it. The London pilgrims soon established a tradition that they should be the first to entertain each new American ambassador to Britain and that his first official speech should be at a pilgrim dinner. They also hosted a farewell dinner for each new British ambassador departing for Washington and welcomed him back after his tour of duty. The New York branch of the Pilgrims was launched at the Wardorf Astoria on the 13th of January 1903 and comprised the most important financiers, politicians, and lawyers on the eastern seaboard. They established a similar, a similar tradition of close interaction with British and American ambassadors. These ambassadorial connections with the Pilgrims would prove crucial in linking the Foreign Secretary in, in, in London and the Secretary of, of State in Washington to the secret elite and its agenda for war. A number of the American Pilgrims also had close links with the New York branch of the secret elite's roundtable. In Britain, at least 18 members of the secret elite, including Lord, Lord Rothschild, Corzon, Northcliffe, Anne Escher, and Sir Edward Gray, and Arthur Balfour, attended Pilgrim's dinners. Through the regularity of their attendance is difficult, though the regularity of their attendance is difficult to establish, such is the perennial problem with secret groups. We know something about the guests invited to dinner, but not what was discussed between courses. In New York, members included both the Rockefeller, the Morgan dynasties, and many men in senior government posts. Initially, member, initially, membership was likewise limited to 500, and it was agreed that any American resident in London who was proposed for membership should first be vetted by the New York Committee. The power elite in America was New York-centered, carried great influence in the domestic and international politics, and was heavily indulgent of Yale, Harvard, and Princeton universities. Within a short period of time, they created an American version of what Carol Quigley termed the triple front penetration of politics, the press, and education. The Pilgrim Society brought together American money and British aristocracy, royalty, presidents, and diplomatic representatives. It was indeed a special relationship. 
of all the American banking establishments, none was more Anglo-centric than the J.P. Morgan Bank itself, itself deeply involved with the pilgrims. Of all the American banking establishments, none was more Anglo-centric than the J.P. Morgan Bank, itself deeply involved with the pilgrims. In the complex world of investment banking, the Morgan Empire owed everything to the Massachusetts-born American George Peabody, who set up a banking firm in London in 1835 to deal in American railroad securities. He later recruited a fellow American, Junius Morgan, father of J.P. Morgan, as a partner in the venture, but they faced ruin when a run of when a run on the banks in 1857 almost bankrupt the company. The rivals were keen to drive the firm out of business. A massive £800,000 $800, loan from the Bank of England, which would have a current equivalence to a half a billion pounds, saw them emerge with an enhanced reputation. Nathaniel Rothschild had developed a close relationship with George Peabody, and he, in turn, proved to be a loyal and grateful friend. The crisis claimed four banks, yet Peabody, Morgan, and company was saved. Why? Who initiated the rescue? The Rothschilds held immense sway in the Bank of England, and the most likely answer is that they intervened to save the firm. Peabody retired in 1864, and Junius Morgan inherited a strong bank, with powerful links to Rothschild. The question to be asked is what the Rothschilds had to gain by such acts of generosity. The rescue packages for failing banks or companies always came at a price. Once saved, the concern would be allowed to continue trading under its old name, and usually with its previous owners and directors, but henceforth it would act as a front company for the Rothschild dynasty. It would move securities, trade, trade on stock markets, front deals, and buy up other companies under the old retained name, and few would know that the Rothschilds were the real purchasing power behind it. When Barring's bank faced similar collapse in 1890, Nathaniel Rothschild headed the emergency committee of the Bank of England. He was not only he not only donated 500,000 pounds directly, but through his cousin. Baron de Rothschilds persuade, persuaded the Bank of France to contribute three million pounds in gold to stave off the crisis. There can be no doubt that by the early 20th century, numerous major banks, including J.P. Morgan and Barings and armament firms, were beholden to in front to or fronts for the, the Rothschilds. The Morgan family wore their affinity to England like a badge of honor. Despite stinging criticism despite stinging criticism from Thomas Jefferson that Julie's father in law, the Reverend John Piermont, was under the influence of the whore of England, his son, John Piermont Morgan Pierpont Morgan was sent to the English high school in Boston and spent much of his younger years absorbing British traditions. He was the ardent Anglophile and admirer of the British Empire. In 1899, J.P. Morgan traveled to England to attend an international bankers' convention and returned to America as the representative of Rothschild's interests in the United States. It was the perfect front. J.P. Morgan, who posed as an upright Protestant guardian of capitalism, who could, raise, who could trace his family roots to pre-revolutionary pre times, acted in the interests of the London Rothschilds and shielded their American profits from the poisons of anti-Semitism. In 1895, the Rothschilds secretly replenished the U.S. gold reserves through J.P. Morgan and raised him to the Premier League of International Banking. In turn, his gratitude was extended to another Rothschild favorite and one of the most powerful men in England, Alfred Milner. In 1901, Morgan offered Milner 
a then massive income of 100000 per annum to become a partner in the London Bank of J.P. Morgan, the London branch of J.P. Morgan. But Milner was not to be distracted from the vital business of the Boer War. J.P. Morgan became the empire loyalist at the heart of the American establishment. A second powerful bank on Wall Street, Kuhn and Loeb and Co., Kub, Loeb and Co., also ser- served as a Rothschild front. The history of these banks, the history of this bank, dated from the Civil War, when two successful German immigrants, Abraham Kuhn and Solomon Loeb, amassed a fortune selling uniforms to the North. They plowed the profits into a small banking house in New York and went back to their Frankfurt roots to find a partner who had banking experience in the European arena. Kuhn and Loeb offered the post to Jacob Scheif, who came from a family close to the Rothschilds. He had been born in the house his parents shared with the Rothschilds in the Jewish quarter of Frankfurt. Schiff was an experienced European banker whose career straddled both continents with contacts in New York, London, Hamburg, and Frankfurt. Edward Cassell was his long-standing friend and was appointed Con Loeb's agent in London. Schiff even dined with King Edward on the strength of Cassell's close friendship with the king. Jacob Schiff married Solomon Loeb's daughter, and backed by Rothschild Gold, quickly gained overall control of the Kun Lo Bank. Schiff returned to Germany and recruited two of his nephews, Paul and Felix Warburg of the M.M. Warburg Bank in Hamburg, both married into the Kun Lo firm and became important players in the lucrative securities market that underpinned the railroad bonanza. Like J.P. Morgan, Baron and Con Loeb, the M.M. Warburg Bank, owed its survival and ultimate success to Rothschild money. It faced bankruptcy, but was rescued by a vast injection of funds from Credit Anstalt, a Rothschild bank in Vienna. These interrelated European banking families understood the nature and politics of the time. The balance of financial power rested in the city in London, but the real opportunities increasingly lay in the United States. That Jacob Schiff and Paul and Felix Warburg were German was of no relevance to their growing allegiance in Germany, was of no relevance to their growing allegiance to America. International financiers do not limit themselves to any national boundary. Theirs is a global market. Schiff and the Warburgs became naturalized Americans. Shedding their German citizenship was only part of a strategy that accommodated the position of this rich Im- of these rich immigrants in New York society. Though they did not entirely abandon Europe, Paul Warburg maintained his partnership in M.M. M. Warburg, which, following the Rothschilds' rescue, became a major bank in Germany's booming economy. The eldest Warburg brother, Max, another who had served part of his apprenticeship with Rothschild in London, controlled their European their European base. He was their natural representative for Kun, Loeb in Germany, and kept in touch with his brother Paul on a daily basis. Insider knowledge always played a key role in the pursuit of profit and what this generation of bankers who were closely linked to the Rothschilds knew was that war in Europe was on was not far off. The strategic alliances with the House of Rothschild and J.P. Morgan played an important part in determining Warburg's meteoric rise in American banking. Of even greater strategic importance was Jacob Schiff's relationship with J.D. Rockefeller, Schiff became the financial strategist, the financial strategist for Rockefeller's Standard Oil, 
which was then refining about 90% of all crude oil in the United States. Rockefeller, who helped to fund the secret elite's New York Roundtable, was an unscrupulous thug, ruthless in his determination to trample opposition and throttle competition. He used monopolistic control in oil by creating a trust that squeezed rivals until they were shorn of sufficient profit to continue trading. He indulged in secret deals to undercut his competitors and expanded his control of the oil business across the the entire American continent. Rockefeller's labor relations belonged to an age of brutality. Strikes were ruthlessly crushed and workers denied basic rights. His worst excess came in 1913 during a miners' strike in Ludlow, where his private agents evicted families, brought in deputies in armored trucks, armored cars, and sprayed machine gun fire and sprayed machine gun fire on striking miners. Tents in which the evicted workers and their families were sheltering were deliberately set on fire, and two women and 11 children were roasted alive. Undeterred, Rockefeller extolled the energetic, fair, and firm way that his mining company had conducted itself. Undeterred, Rockefeller extolled the energetic, fair, and firm way that his mining company had conducted itself. Such desperate inhumanity in the pursuit of profit contrasted with the public image Rockefeller presented of Christian benevolence and cultural philanthropy. On the surface, they were, there were periods of blistering competition between the investment and banking houses, the steel companies, the railroad builders, and the two international Goliaths, the Goliaths of oil, Rockefeller and Rothschild. But by the turn of the century, the surviving conglomerates adopted a more subtle relationship, which avoided real competition. A decade earlier, Baron Alphonse de Rothschild had accepted Rockefeller's invitation to meet in New York behind the closed doors of Standard Oil's headquarters on Broadway. John D. Archbold, Standard Oil's chief negotiator, reported that they had quickly reached a tentative agreement and thought it desirable on both sides that such that that the matter be kept confidential. Clearly both understood the advantage of monopolistic collusion. It was a trend that they developed to their own advantage. Most of much of the assumed rivalry between major stakeholders in banking, industry, and commerce was a convenient facade, though they would have the, con- the world believe otherwise. Consider, please, this convenient facade. Official Rothschild biographers would have us believe that Rothschild's interest in America was limited to that, n- limited in that the American Civil War led to a permanent decline in the Rothschild's transatlantic flu- influence. All our evidence points in the opposite direction. Their associates, agents, and front companies permeated American finance and industry. Their influence was literally everywhere. J.P. Morgan, the acknowledged chieftain of the Anglo-American financial establishments, was the main conduit for British capital and a personal friend of the Rothschilds. Jacob Scheif and Cunnan Loeb, Another close friend of the Rothschild family worked hand in glove with Rockefeller in oil, railroad, and banking enterprises. The December 1912 Truth magazine stated, Mr. Scheif, Mr. Schiff is head of the great private banking house of Kun Loeb and Company, which represents the Rothschild's interests on the side of the Atlantic. He has been described as a financial strategist and has been for years the financial minister of the great impersonal power known as Standard Oil. If the article was written to shock Wall Street, it failed abysmally. What it demonstrated was that Jacob Schiff, the pilgrim, was both a Rothschild agent and a trusted associate of J.D. Rockefeller, the pilgrim. 
Morgan, Schiff, and Rockefeller, the three leading players on Wall Street, had settled into a cozy cartel behind which the House of Rothschilds remained hidden but retained immense influence and power. Control of capital and credit was increasingly concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer men until the rival banking groups ceased to operate in genuine competition. U.S. politicians readily succumbed to the money power influence. The Rothschild's first agent in the United States, August Belmont, served as the chairman of the served as the chairman of the Democratic Party National Committee from 1860 to 1872. The Morgan Bank had an enormous influence on President Grover Cleveland, who spent most of his life life inside the Morgan Empire. Virtually all of his senior appointments were Morgan men, with an occasional place at the table for other bankers. His first Secretary of State, Thomas F. Bayard, was a close ally and disciple of August Belmont, the, the dominant Secretary of State in the second Cleveland administration was a leading lawyer for banking interests and was on the board of the Morgan-run company. Men close to Rothschild had the Democratic Party sewn up. Rockefeller and his empire also treated the federal government with barely disguised contempt. His aforementioned chief executive, John F. John D. Archibald, procured the services of elected representatives by including them on the company payroll. One senator from Ohio was paid 44000 in a six-month period, while another, form, while another from Pennsylvania received 42500 Archbold was called to testify before a committee investigating the dubious contributions that Standard Oil had given to Republican campaign funds. He claimed that the President Theodore Roosevelt was aware of the $125,000 contribution made previously by the Standard Oil Company to the Republican Party. Roosevelt was adamant that he had ordered his campaign team to reject such donations. Whatever the truth, the government of the United States, irrespective of which party was in power, was in the grip of the big banks close to Rothschild, Rockefeller, and the secret elite. The Morgan Rockefeller Cun Loeb Access on Wall Street planned to consolidate their grip on America by settling up by setting up a central bank that, like those in Europe, would be owned and controlled not by government but by banks. Their banks The problem facing the money power was that banks and bankers were not popular with the ordinary citizen in the United States and they were widespread public antipathy 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 there was widespread public antipathy toward a central bank the secret elite solution was to deliberately create a banking crisis that would frighten the populace into accepting banking reforms Shortly after a five-month spell in England in 1907, J.P. Morgan found the perfect opportunity. A rogue spectator, Augustus Hines, owner of the Knickerbocker Bank, had been serendipitously, serendipitously, surreptitiously using depositors' money in an attempt to corner the stocks of the United Copper Company. Its value had been pumped up to $62 per share, but two days later, close to $15 per share. Heinz lost a fortune, and the Knickerbocker Bank immediately faced problems over this, its solvency. When the National Bank of Commerce, part of Morgan's financial empire, publicly refused to accept Knickerbocker's checks, rumors spread rapidly. Morgan's decision scared other institutions from offering financial support. And next morning, on the 22nd of October, the Knickerbocker's depositors were so desperate they withdrew $8 million during a three-hour run. 
Depositors at other banks across America panicked, attempted to withdraw their savings, and the anticipated domino effect kicked in. Having caused the crash, Morgan took personal charge of reversing it, though he was neither elected nor appointed to the task. In doing so, he assumed the mantle of savior of the American banking system. With the government's approval, Morgan browbeat bankers and trust company presidents into contributing to the rescue package. Rothschild hailed Morgan as a man of wonderful resources. His latest action fills one with admiration and respect for him. It was a vote of approval from the boss of bosses to one of his trusted lieutenants. The Panic of 1907 ran like a true Rothschild scam orchestrated by Morgan to prove the absolute necessity of a central bank. Something had to be done. The Senate was warned. We may not always have Piermont Morgan with us to meet a banking crisis. Thereafter, the establishment of a central bank was presented as the solution to avert future financial crisis. In 1915, a committee of the House of Representatives, chaired by Congressman Arsen Pujo presented a report on the banking business and demonstrated that Morgan Placeman held multiple dictatorship, held multiple directorships in interrelated banks, insurance companies, and giant business corporations. Pujo demonstrated that the banking system was run like an exclusive private club and that the New York Stock Exchange dealt in dishonest, unwholesome speculation. In the recent panic, malpractice by the major banks had become had been had made the situation much worse much worse and resulted in banking collapse, which they used to their own advantage. The abuse of ordinary stockholders, the unhealthy increase in the control of money centered on New York and the multiple affiliations inside major banking houses like J.P. Morgan, the First National Bank of New York, National City Bank, and Kahn and Loeb Company made appalling reading. Big business in the U.S. lay in the hand of just a few men who controlled the banks. Pujol's evidence proved that five banking firms held 341 dictators directorships to 112 corporations valued at over $22 billion. Pujol dissected the rampant abuses of financial power, and his final report revealed corporate banking abuse at a pandemic level. The report was, however, not what it seemed. Like many other commissions before and after, it shielded it shield away from penetrating questions on the crucial matter of foreign investment houses and their massive influence over U.S. banking and industry. The name Rothschild remained unspoken. Amongst the few politicians who railed against the corruption in American banking, Congressman Lindenberg and Senator Lafayette stood tall. They never ceased to demand that the system be thoroughly cleansed and repeatedly called for an investigation with teeth. Tellingly, they were denied access to the Pujol Committee. <clears throat> the only witnesses allowed to testify were the banksters themselves. <coughs> the entire object of the run on the banks was to frighten the public into believing that urgent reform on the banking of the banking system was necessary to protect their savings and that Wall Street should be brought under control. The public, who had objected to a central bank for many years, had to be made to believe that banking reform was precisely what was needed. No one appeared to appreciate that the biggest advocates of banking reform were the bankers themselves. Their standing in the community assumed toxic proportions in terms of the popular reaction, but they used that to pursue their near-impossible dream of a U.S. central bank. The lie was repeated over and over again, 
that only a central bank could bring banks and banksters to public account. The case they put forward argued that the government would reg would regulate and control banking in the interest of the people, but nothing could have been further from the truth. This was the colossal fraud perpetrated by the money power. As Professor Quigley explained, these bankers sought nothing less than to create a world system of monetary control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and thus the economy of the world as a whole. This could only happen if the United States had a central bank like those in England and France. Contrary to widespread belief, the Bank of England was not a public institution but an operated and controlled but was operated and controlled by banksters by bankers such as the Rothschilds and brooked no semblance of political interference. In France, there was, a more, there was a more complex system of seniority and stability where a number of traditional banking families were considered part of the elite hot banquet that in turn controlled the Bank of France. Two dominant private French banking firms, Rothschild and Mirabar, Mirabar, Mirabad, Mirabad were more closely were more powerful than all the others put together. In Germany, the Reichsbank was a rich institution which with the power to print money but was much more directly under the control of the government than either the Bank of England or the Bank of France. The money power in New York wanted the same control that the banksters, the, that the bankers in England and France enjoyed, namely freedom from government interference, the right to print money, control of rates and of interest, and to stay safely anonymous behind an executive appointed by themselves. This is why Paul Warburg was on hand. The German banker had been chosen by a money power to drive forward their ambition, ambitious plan for a U.S. central bank. Though Jacob Schiff brought him to New York to help him run the Kun Low Bank, Warburg still committed six months to each year to his family bank in Hamburg. Following the 1907 panic, Paul was presented as the guru of central banking, who just happened to be in New York and just happened to decide to file for American citizenship. He was reluctant. He was a reluctant warrior who appeared just in time to sweep into battle for the noble cause of the central bank. The fable would have us believe that the New York Times just happened to ask Paul who could barely write in English, who could hardly write in English, to pen an article about banking reform. He dusted off an essay he just happened to have written when he arrived in America, and it was duly published in the November 12, 19, in 1907 of November 12th, under the headline, under the headline, Defects and Needs of, of Our Banking System. He followed that up with a short piece in the New York Times Annual Financial Review entitled, Plan for a Modified Central Bank. Warburg argued that nothing short of a central bank would solve the currency problem. He expanded upon these initial thoughts with the publication of a United Reserve Bank of the United States and he was duly dispatched across America on a promotional tour lecturing on the values of a central bank. Congressmen and senators were bombarded with advice. Pamphlets and articles were penned in favor of a banking system that would mystically put control back into the hands of the people and break the grip of the money trust, and thus the lie was spread. Senator Nelson Aldrich of Rhode Island was chosen by the secret elite to be the voice of social economic in the sentence in the Senate. A wealthy businessman and father in law of John D. Rockefeller, Aldrich was known to Morgan's floor broker in the Senate 
shameless in his excesses. He used public office to feather his own very large nest. Public service was to him more little, little more than a cash cow. He built a 99-room chateau, chateau and sailed a 200-foot yacht. Over a, over a two-year period, Paul Warburg and J.P. Morgan worked steadily on their corrupt senator to turn him into an expert on banking systems. Congress adopted a National Monetary Commission in 1908 with Aldridge as chairman to review U.S. banking. Its members toured Europe supposedly collected, collecting data on various banking systems. Aldridge's final tour, however, was not the product of any European study tour, but of a collective conspiracy. In November of 1910, five bankers representing Morgan, Rockefeller, and Cunloeb interests met in total secrecy with Senator Aldrich and the, assent and the Assistant Secretary to the U.S. Treasury on Jekyll Island, an exclusive report off the coast of Georgia, an exclusive resort off the coast of Georgia. Of the seven conspirators, five, Senator Aldrich, Henry Davidson, Benjamin Strong, Frank Vanderlip, and Paul Warburg, were members of the Pilgrims. Their objective was to formulate a central banking bill that would be presented to Congress as if it were the brainchild of the Aldrich Monetary Commission. In a scenario more reminiscent of the B-movie plot, then the confused reality of the super wealthy, the group traveled from New Jersey to Georgia in Senator Aldrich's private railway carriage with blinds drawn, using aliases and purporting to be on a duck shooting trip. Regular servants were sent away and temporary, replace, and temporary replacements hired lest anyone was recognized. Their paranoia stemmed from the justified fear that should any journalist see them all together, the whole conspiracy would be blown apart. For nine days, they thrashed out the details of a central banking system that they secretly wanted put in place. The title, Central Bank, had to be avoided. In order to deceive the American people, so they decide... The title, Central Bank, had to be avoided in order to deceive the American people, so they decided to misname it the Federal Reserve System, though it would be neither federal nor reserve. A proposed system was to be owned entirely by pri private banks, although its name implied that it was a government institution Individuals from the American banking dynasty, including Morgan, Warburg, Schiff, and Rockefeller, would hold the shares. It was to be a central bank of issue that would have a monopoly on all of all the money and credits of the people of the United States. It would control the interest rates and the volume of money in circulation. The Federal Reserve System constructed on Jekyll's Island and powers that the King Midas can never have contemplated. The objective was to establish a franchise to create money out of nothing for the purpose of lending, get the taxpayer to pick up any losses and convince Congress that the aim was to protect was to protect the country the public. When the proposal took shape in Congress, there was one overarching flaw. Senator Aldrich insisted on appealing, on appending his name to it, despite Paul Warburg's warning that it would automatically be associated with Wall Street and proven a necessary obstacle. His ego prevailed, and Warburg's concern proved justified. 
the Aldrich proposal never went to vote. President Taft refused to support his bill on the grounds that it would not appear sufficient government control over the banks. The money power decided that Taft had to go. Their support in the 1912 presidential election swung behind the little-known Democrat candidate Woodrow Wilson. The speed with which Wilson was bounced from his hope, bounced from his post at Princeton University in 1910 to governor of New Jersey in 1911. Then Democratic Party nominee for the presidency in 1912 made him the Solomon Grundy of U.S. politics. Grassroots Democrat in New Jersey were opposed to having Wilson were opposed to having Wilson imposed on them by the big interests in New York, but they quickly caved in. Rarely was there ever such a concerted and focused effort to remove a Republican president from office and replace him with a Democratic Party puppet. Sponsored by Cleveland H. Hodge, director of Rockefeller's National City Bank, and a friend of both Rockefeller and Morgan, Woodrow Wilson was thrust into the presidential race in 1912. The money power opened a campaign office for him at 42 Broadway and opened two-thirds of his campaign funds came directly from Wall Street. Wilson lied about his politics during the campaign and betrayed the Democratic heritage of President Jefferson and Jackson by courting the bankers and representing their interests. His public utterances were a master class in hypocrisy. He campaigned in 1912 under the banner of New York's freedom in opposition to monopoly powers, yet within a, yet within a year had given up had given the banks had given the banks exactly that. No matter the extent of financial backing, Wilson would never have defeated a popular president like Taft without devious tactics crafted by his political puppet masters. Clear favorite. For a second term in office, Taft's chance of success was seriously undermined when another Republican former President Theodore Roosevelt enters the race. Financed by Morgan's associate in Wall Street, Roosevelt created a third eye, the Bull Loose Party. The Bull Moose Party from thin air and effectively split the Republican vote, while the Morgan team were destroying Taft's chance at victory, Paul Warburg and J- Jacob Scheif completed the prime, the pincer movement by backing Wilson, and ensuring his election was, and ensuring his election, Wilson won the forty-two cents of votes cast. Roosevelt took twenty-seven percent while Taft could only muster 23%. The remainder, which to the socialist conf- candidate Eugene Debs, the party, the, rep- the Republicans were all, also rooted in the Senate election, where the Democrats emerged with a, clear demo- with a clear majority. Not only did the money power put them, their man in the White House, they also drew they also gave him minder gave him a minder edward mandel's house a british trained political operative woodrow wilson was president of the united states but his shadowy figure stood by his side controlling his every move like escher and to some extent milner House preferred to influence politics from behind the scenes rather than take public office. He had been part educated in England and was credited with swinging the Democratic Convention in Baltimore in 1912 behind Wilson. He became Woodrow Wilson's constant companion from that point onwards with his own suite of rooms in the White House. He was also in direct, sometimes daily, contact with J.P. Morgan, Schiff, Warburg, 
and Democrat senators who sponsored the Federal Reserve Bill. House guided the president in every aspect of foreign and domestic policy, chose his cabinet, and formulated the first policies of his new administration. He was the prime intermediary between the president and his Wall Street backers. This president was not to be left to his own devices. The governance of America fell step by step under the juggernaut of investment bankers closely linked to the Rothschilds. The original Aldrich Bill was revised, renamed, and steered through both houses of Congress with great speed. On Tuesday, the 23rd of December 1913, the technically, the technically named Glass, Glass Owen Bill, it was barely distinguishable from the Aldrich Bill, rejected by Taft two years previously, was finally presented to the Senate. It provided for the establishment of the Federal Reserve Banks for furnishing an elastic currency, affording means of, re of rediscounting commercial paper, and to establish a more effective banking system in the United States and for other purposes. Despite loud and constant protestation, protestation from senior Republican senators, the subcommittee that had been set up to find solutions to contentious points was usurped by the Democratic majority. Every contentious issue was decided in favor of the elite bankers. What had started off as a proposal for public ownership of the stock and government control of the banks ended up as a system whose stock was owned by the banks and controlled by the banks. In impotent frustration, Senator Bristow of Kansas pointed out that every provision in this bill that was in favor of the banks had been retained. The provisions that were struck out were provisions in the interest of the public. After four hours of political sniping, the bill was formally passed through the Senate by 43 votes to 25, with the further 27 senators not voting. Later that day, in the House of Representatives, the lone voice of Representative Finlay H. Gray railed against the Wall Street bankers and their deliberate plan and conspiracy to discredit the national bank currency so that there might be reared upon its ruins a central autocratic bank under private control. Too late. The horse had well and truly bolted. The bill was rushed through on the but the rush the bill was rushed through on the Tuesday night before Christmas nineteen thirteen, signed quickly by the compliant President Wilson and legally in place as an act of Congress before the morning newspaper hit the streets. Most importantly, by clever, by clever sleight of hand political maneuvering, it was precisely the opposite of what the public had been promised. What impact did this have on the well-coordinated secret plans, secret elite plans for war? What did it matter if the richest economy in the world gifted control of its money supply to the major private bankers? War is required to be financed and cost immense sums of money. In Britain, France, Russia, and Germany, the national coffers were also bare, were almost bare. Outrageous spending on armaments and growing indebtedness had left virtually every treasury in Europe dangerously close to empty. <laughs> a new source of funding was required, a supply of money that could expand in line with the demand of desperate nations willing to pay handsomely for massive loans. <laughs> now, that was, now that was something that a U.S. central bank, unfettered by government control, responding to unlimited demand could do. The Federal Reserve Act was passed in December of 1913, and the seven-man board took office on August 10th of 1914, by which time the war, but we are running ahead of ourselves. Rhodes' American dream took shape. Close links with the American establishment had been cemented through the round table and the pilgrims, and grew in strength behind the closed doors of private dinners in London and New York. The Anglo-centric money power had finally established its central bank in time for the secret elites war. 
Consider the last two chapters and ponder its significance. By February 1913, two major powers, the United States and France, had new presidents who were elected to office through the machinations of the secret elite. Woodrow Wilson had been elevated to the presidency of America by the money power in the United States. Raymond Poincaré's election was likewise paid for by bribery and corruption funded through bankers and financiers in London and Paris. The secret elite had positioned key players in the government of Britain, France, Russia, and United States. Politics, money, and power were the pillars. Politics, money, and power were the pillars on which the Anglo-Saxon elite would destroy Germany and take control of the world. Summary, Chapter 17, America, A Very Special Relationship Cecil Rhodes appreciated the importance of the United States in the pursuit of a world dominated by the Anglo-Saxon race. More Rhodes scholarships were, were awarded to the United States than anywhere else. The real aristocracy in America was the money power that comprised the obscenely rich industrialists, financiers, and oil men who dominated politics and society. The Pilgrims was an exclusive society founded in 1902, ostensibly to promote goodwill and friendship between Britain and the United States. It provided a pool of wealth and exclusivity through which the secret elite could spread its values and increase its power. Secret elite politicians and businessmen attended pilgrim functions, but no records exist of the private discussions fostered in these exclusive gatherings. Economic power was increasingly invested in a small number of New York-based family dynasties, dynasties including the House of Morgan and Rockefeller. The Rothschilds were closely associated with Morgan and other emer emerging banks and bankers in New York including Kahn, Loeb, and Co., Joseph Scheif, Joseph Schiff, and Paul War Warburg, and did not withdraw from the American market. The money power sought to convince politicians that the United States, like European nations, required a central bank to control the system of money. The 1907 banking crisis happened because the bankers wanted to prove their point that a central agency was required to bring stability to banking. Corrupt politicians, in particular Senator Nelson Aldrich, fronted the drive to have congressional approval for a central bank. He colluded with other banking conspirators representing Morgan and Rockefeller, most of whom were pilgrims, to promote a federal bank reserve. Federal Reserve Bank for the United States. It failed to pass into law and the money power turned against President, Tra President Taft. They manipulated the presidential election of 1912 to have Taft replaced by puppet President Woodrow Wilson. A Federal Reserve System passed into law in December of 1913 it gave ownership and control of the money supply in America to private banks.